on this edition of Independent Sources, Caribbean Disunity. Is Caribbean leadership in the city missing a strong voice and where could it come from? The details coming up. Independent Sources, your window to the city's ethnic and immigrant communities. Here's your host, Gary Pierre-Pierre. The recent concern over Dominica's plight being undercovered after the recent barrage of hurricanes that flattened some of the Caribbean islands has raised a broader issue, that of, in a city full of West Indian immigrants, why wasn't the community able to sound a stronger rallying cry? New York has the largest number of Caribbean immigrants in the country, but much of the Afro-Caribbean voice from the smaller group of islands called the Lesser Antilles remains relatively muted compared to that of their bigger cousins, such as Jamaica and Hispaniola. We wanted to delve into what's behind the disconnect between the significant population of West Indians and the division that has led to their relatively small impact on the city's social political landscape. Someone, I sat down uh, with Medgar Evers professor Dr. John Flato and um, Felicia Perso of the marketing agency Carrie PR Wire join us via Skype to talk about this disconnect. Dr. Flato, there's a general sense in some quarters that uh, the Caribbean community did not rally around the victims in the Caribbean like in Dominica and other parts of the Caribbean that were seriously hit by uh, Hurricane Maria. Why is that? Well, I, I'm from, uh, I'll say I'm from Brooklyn, <laughs> the semi-sovereign nation state of Brooklyn, where we have over a million people of, of African descent and a very large uh, 400,000 or more Caribbean Americans. And that's not the sense that I have uh, on the ground in Brooklyn. Uh, via Medgar Evers College, we have relief efforts underway, and I know that a number of uh, Caribbean Americans from some of the islands that were hardest hit are undertaking relief efforts uh, via their networks mm -hmm. throughout Brooklyn and beyond. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the megaphone probably could be louder. Well, part of it is that, is that network kind of limited? I mean, how broad is it? I, obviously, you know, it's, it's clear that help was done. There were things that were done. The question is that what was done, was it enough? Did we do it with a certain level of energy and intensity uh, like in other parts of the world? I would say the answer to that is uh, more effort, uh, more initiative should be taking place now. There needs to be more momentum. I think the predominant part of the focus has been on the on the uh, island, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico that was hit mm -hmm. uh, very hard, and then mainland U U.S. those areas there that were hit mm -hmm. hard, and it is going to be incumbent on the leadership in, coming out of the Caribbean American community to uh, raise that that profile. That yes, our island nations were hit very hard too, and and we want our our people to step up the American government to step up and be as helpful as they can also. So Felicia, I'd like for you to uh, address this point about leadership in the Caribbean American community in, in, in New York. I mean, what's the structure of that leadership and, 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 and who's doing what and, 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 and where is it going? First of all, I think what we're seeing is that there are a lot of people who are getting elected across our Caribbean diaspora, whether you look here in South Florida or in New York, but we're not seeing the power uh, resonating on a national level. We're not getting the recognition as a Caribbean American bloc that we should be getting given our numbers and given the fact that we're sending back millions of dollars uh, per year supporting another uh, economy in many instances. Um, we're just not seeing that. And that is largely because we have a, we have many leaders and not enough soldiers, and that really is our problem. So everybody has an organization. Everybody is trying to be the chief, and we don't have enough Indians, and that's really uh, where our issue is, because we're talking so much among ourselves we're not really talking to the people who can actually make a difference. I mean, we see, for instance, the West Indian American Day Carnival, 50 years. And what do we have uh, really to show for it, except for a major photo op 
every year where all the politicians come because they see our power, they see the numbers. But by six o'clock, we're like the garbage on the street that's being swept up. Uh, there is no more recognition uh, for us. And we see this again with this hurricane relief effort to have so much emphasis being put, uh, especially on Puerto Rico, but not even the U.S. territory of the U.S. Virgin Islands is getting as much emphasis when they're also without power, they're also without water. Um, and so it comes back to just our strength. We have strength in numbers. We're really not marshalling that and we're not harnessing it as much as we're putting as much effort into setting up churches all across our communities. So we have so much churches, but if we would marshal that into a political force, we really would be something to be reckoned with. So Dr. Flato, why do you think we're not harnessing that power? Well, I think, uh, as uh, Felicia mentioned, we have another dynamic going on. She did mention larger numbers of new elected officials, and that's, in the short run, that's a part of the problem. They're, they're newly elected. In the last four or five years, we've turned over probably half of black public officials uh, dumb in New York City. So you have a lot of elected officials that have been in office two years, four years at this point. And you have the older guard that has been moved on. That's the life cycle. That's, that's the way it should be. But I think we're in a transitional moment now where someone uh, I can name call out the roster, Pierre-Louis, Suffolk County, Salage, Nassau. We have a half a dozen mostly Caribbean American women elected just within the last four or five years, right out of Brooklyn also, Persaud, Williams, Richardson, Bichotte. And they are finding, I, I believe they're getting their footing in the political establishment, in the institutions that they're operating in. Most of them are in the New York State Assembly, but they're not senior members yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're doing the best that they can to push on issues like immigrant rights, like minority and women business, uh, government contracting, uh, criminal justice reform, improved police community relations, and health care, which is a major uh, 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 scenario underway, total reengineering going on right now. This is sort of the, the washback coming from the attempts at the national level to uh, dismantle what is called Obamacare, and then uh, the affordable housing slash gentrification crisis that is that is underway. Um, the bubble burst in, in 2008 and 9 and wiped out a lot of our, our personal wealth, our home ownership uh, assets in places like Central Brooklyn, Southeast Queens. So we're in recovery mode. I think we've got a whole new class of, of uh, Caribbean American, younger elected officials, and uh, that's, there's a gap there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they, they're going to need to catch up fast uh, to be ahead, uh, to be out in front on the, on the kinds of issues that, that uh, Felicia is raising. But I'm optimistic that uh, that's going to happen, and it needs to happen sooner than later. Felicia, how united are we as a community? Um, not very, I would say. I mean, what we're seeing is a lot of major groups. When you look at Jamaicans, Jamaicans have been largely out front, uh, taking a lot of these issues and, and of course, getting elected uh, into many positions, Jamaicans and Jamaican-Americans, so they're definitely running with it. And we see that dissecting of the community very clearly recently in this hurricane, for instance, where everybody is focused on their country and raising funds and raising donations uh, for their country and not so much uh, seeing that spillover as a Caribbean uh, American uh, community, except for a lot of Jamaican artists who themselves have stepped up to the plate, uh, kudos to them. Uh, so we're not seeing that as much and we're seeing further uh, racial dissection when you look at, especially when you look at indo Guyanese in Richmond Hill, a very strong power base, but yet not politically connected. Uh, you look at other communities, the Haitians have their issues, but yet a lot of Caribbean Americans are not embracing them, um, especially with the TPS uh, and pushing for that agenda as well. And, you know, we, we just have to keep on pushing. I, I love uh, Professor Flatto's 
uh, positivity and optimism because we definitely need it, uh, especially now more than ever. But I think we also, as voters, as Caribbean Americans, we have to hold our elected officials accountable, hold their feet to the fire and start pushing our issues. I know they, are, they may be there just one or two years, but hey, you ran on an agenda and we need to see that agenda being played out, especially for our community. We need more dynamic leaders. And I think that is really where we have, as young people, we have to engage our young people, bring them into our organizations and not mm -hmm. try to keep holding on there until we're dropping down. We'll do for our first break right now. We'll be right back with more from Dr. John Flateau and Felicia Perceau. Thanks for staying tuned. Dr. Flato, you wanted to say something uh, earlier? Yes, uh, Felicia was touching on the, say, political engagement on politics, political process. And our voter registration in, in the Caribbean American community is at an all-time high. That's according to your center, that you, the center you ran. The Du Bois Barnes Center for Public Policy. We, we monitor election data. And I also uh, am involved in, in that arena as well. But uh, so registration is at an all time high, but voter participation is at an all time low. Why is that? Well, that, that's the next point I'm getting to. The why is that clearly there's a disconnect. So we can't, we don't want to blame our, the larger community for being disengaged because the question is no longer they're not registered voters. They are registered. So there's something that is not appealing, that is not mobilizing, uh, that is not reaching the masses of our residents in these neighborhoods and in these communities. And that is part of the, the short fuse that our, our new generation of electeds is working with. We've got to figure out how to close that gap. It's our millennials. It's probably heavily the under 35 to 40 uh, young adults. Part of, I think, the problem, the answer to the why is a lack of voter education. We have voter registration, but I think the emphasis now has to be more on voter education, political education, understanding the process, and even underst understanding fundamentally that part of our job is to hold our elected officials accountable. Yes, it's great that we have registered voters, but if they're not coming out to vote in the primary, the mayoral primary we just had, there was barely a 10% turnout citywide. So that's, so 90% are, are at home and there's whatever this little small 10% elite that, that does understand the process is enough to keep our elected officials in place. And there needs to be more heat uh, uh, on the process and, and more uh, educated voters holding our electeds accountable and holding government accountable. Okay. Uh, Felicia, last time you were on the show, we were talking about a Carib ID program with uh, working with the census to identify us better. And part of that reason is what Dr. Flateau is talking about, organizing and all of that. So how is that going? How did it go? Well, we actually uh, have some very good news to report for 2020, the next census. Uh, there is going to be a category under the African-American section of the census where people from the Caribbean would be able to write in their country of origin. Um, so we're very excited about that because it is a start. It is a step in the right direction. And, you know, of course, we've spent many years lobbying and fighting for this. Um, and I think that is going to help us tremendously in telling our economic story and starting to make sure that people understand that we're not just here, but we're really making a difference. We're making a difference in all sectors across this country. And that really uh, is what we're hopeful for in 2020, that people are going to take advantage of this and fill out those forms. How significant is that for the larger community, to the Caribbean community? Well, it's, it's, a li it's life and death. Mm -hmm. um, in 2010, or what's going to be very important this time around is to understand that the national government that's in place in 2020 
is very different from the national government that was running the national census 10 years ago. There are already major signs that the budget for this census is shrinking. That it's go this is going to be the first digital census. We already have a divide uh, between upper income folks. So, so how do you think that's going to impact the Caribbean? It community? could be a very negative impact if we don't get ready. We're sitting here in 2017. If we don't ensure, and this is an advantage for the millennials, the digital census, because this is their main means of communication now. So they need to be reconnected politically. That would help close uh, that gap. But what we're also going to need is resources at the city and state level, which rolls right back to our elected officials. They need to understand that we're not going to see, I don't believe, the level of resources coming out of Washington to make sure that every American, everyone, everywhere gets counted and counted only once. That's Why, that's why do you say slogan. that? Because of who the, there's a, there's a Republican uh, uh, presidency and there's a House and a Senate controlled by the Republican Party and the mostly communities of color if you do a straight up political analysis, they, they vote heavily Democratic. So just on a political motivation uh, front, you're not going to see, I don't believe, the federal government putting overwhelming resources into outreach, education. And the other problem we have is that uh, uh, with the closing the gate on immigrant rights, um, that's going to have a negative impact as well on encouraging people to get counted in the 2020 census. So we have a range of issues that, that we're going to have to internally educate our communities with and where we, in a, in a place like New York City, where you have an administration that, that has taken a stand, we're gonna, we are a sanctuary city. You're more likely to get resources okay. coming from the city government to help with that education and outreach in our local communities, in our communities of color, to make sure that we participate in the census. If we don't, we're going to lose congressional representation and we're going to lose uh, programs and services government services that are based on that census count. Okay, okay. So, Felicia, earlier you mentioned about us needing, we in the Caribbean community needing more soldiers. Who's going to take up that mental? Well, I'm hoping that everybody else uh, would, because, you know, I said, like, like I said, we have leaders who just don't have soldiers. So we need more soldiers coming up to the table. We need the people who have been elected to be more dynamic leaders we need them to engage with millennials on social media and be there. I, I think part of the reason why we're not seeing as much of a voter turnout is because the young people are not as engaged. They don't have anyone with the dynamism that they need to get themselves energized. And I think that is where our leaders are lacking because they're often in the background. We have to step up, uh, especially now ahead of the census to make sure that our leaders actually stay there. There isn't as much redistricting as we, we usually see after censuses. Um, and we're actually taking advantage of what will come, especially telling our story in this census. So we need everybody to get energized and get organized and not just uh, try to stay in their little corner of the world, but really try to engage and, and, and see this. Uh, beyond self-empowerment, but see this as a major needed aspect of our community empowerment. Dr. Flato, am I sort of like, uh, over, are we over underestimating the, the influence of the Caribbean community? Because a lot of the so-called African-American leaders are indeed Caribbean. So yes. how, how do you <laughs> bring the two together? How do you make that point and, 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 and see that success as part of Caribbean acculturation? Uh, I, I, I think you're right in terms of, of using that term, underestimation. Uh, I mean, part of being in America is about assimilation. You have a lot of first, actually a growing number of second and third generation Caribbean descent elected officials. But I would, I would say, Felicia mentioned, for example, the, the West Indian American Day Parade. Not in good terms, though. <laughs> yeah, but in terms, not in terms of what has been the economic payoff for parading literally to the world 
the power and potency of Caribbean culture and its contribution to American mm -hmm. uh, culture. And how do we leverage that the same way that other uh, arts and cultural uh, uh, commodities are leveraged? Yes, we have not, we have not done that. But it has, it, it has kept the, the image and the identity of Caribbean culture, I believe, in the forefront along with, along with other activities, art, music, the culinary arts. Um, I, when you drive throughout central Brooklyn, there are now streets named after, after Caribbean American and Caribbean heroes. You can't drive from one side of Brooklyn to the other with not running into, without running into boulevards named, you know, Toussaint L'Overture and Wesley McDonald Holder and Bob Marley. That's not accidental. That's a very powerful cultural statement that we have to give a little credit to our elected officials. They're the ones that went into the city council. Now, that's not, that should not be the sum total of their delivery for our community street name changes. There's a lot of other substantive issues we have to deal with. But there's a dynamic of a assimilation that in some, ironically, may be undercutting the, <clears throat> the, the, the potency of Caribbean political power. Okay. In that sense, there is no one district. Co co the largest uh, congressional district with Caribbean population in New York and almost in America is Congresswoman Clark's district. In, that in district that, is that only Clark. yes. That district is only 55 percent people of African descent, and they're not all Caribbean American either. She's got to represent 100 percent of the constituents throughout those neighborhoods that are, that are in our community. So maybe that okay. is also part of the uh, dynamic that is uh, diffusing, you might say, uh, the power and potency of, of Caribbean uh, culture and politics. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We'll have to end the conversation here. Thanks to Dr. John Flato, Chair of the Department of Public Administration at Medgar Evers, and Felicia Perso of Cary PL Wire. Still to come on the show, Chillin' Caribbean Style. Finally from us, Creme and Coco is a new creamery in Brooklyn bringing an island twist to ice cream and sorbets. Zyphus LeBron visited the business and filed this report. And I probably have to figure out some streets. Uh... Creme and Coco on Nostrand and Leffert's Ave is the latest small batch creamery to set up shop in Brooklyn. The store has been around since July, providing the neighborhood so, with the owner's take on some classic yeah. Caribbean concoctions. Our Caribbean ice cream has a, a standard of their flavors, so like the rum and raisins, grape nuts, sour sops. We do a twist on some of the flavors. The day we were there, the best sellers for the week were a strawberry Moscato sorbet and dark chocolate stout ice cream. Thorpe, who is Panamanian, and his wife Astrid, who is Haitian, get their flavor inspiration from their cultural backgrounds. I was born in Panama, but my legacy traces back from Jamaica, Grenada, so all the aspects of, of, of recipes of all sorts, so like sorrel-based recipes, to Christmas cake, to coquito, to all of those type of, were influenced by the legacy of my family. That legacy has done more than just influence their choice of flavors. We use all natural ingredients. So it's nothing that's, you know, we don't use any of the gums, we don't use any of, you know, all the chemicals aspects. So we just use the milk base, our sugar base, our additives. Locally sourced additives such as guava and passion fruit allow the self-described ice cream and dessert fan to make all the product on the premises. Today I'll be showing a strawberry guava sorbet and a passion fruit um, mango sorbet. What the process entails is making the puree is combining sugar and the fruits and blending them up together and cooling it for a duration of hours and then running it in the machine. 
The creamery was created as a back end to support the cafe that also shares the space. Thorpe says the business is picking up despite some initial skepticism. Folks are always ask me, oh, um, so how are you going to sell ice cream in the winter time? I'm like, people don't eat ice cream in the winter time? <laughs> like, everyone he still eats ice cream. Guava, sorbet. It's that optimism that's got Thorpe so possibly I, heading back to school to learn more about ice cream um, production. He's also cooking up a plan to extend their business beyond Brooklyn. Zyphus Lebrun, Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.